My name is Alexis Davis. I'm the social media manager here at RSDSA. I'm joined by Jim Broach, executive vice president and director of RSDSA, CRPS warrior Kelly Considine, and our final conference speaker for the week, Dr. Heather Rarish. Dr. Rarish is a physician, author, and researcher at the VA Boston Healthcare System, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. He has published more than 140 papers, including original research in the New England Journal of Medicine, the Journal of the American Medical Association, and the British Medical Association. He frequently writes for the New York Times and Washington Post, and is the author of the books Modern Death, State of the Heart, and the just published The Song of Our Scars, The Untold Story of Pain. And we are very excited to have him here this evening. And as always, remember that while the information shared here is helpful, please consult your physician for personalized medical advice. Now, this session is definitely going to be interactive. Jim and Kelly are going to facilitate and they are going to make sure that we are um, talking about this amazing book and um, asking all the questions that I know you all have. So be sure to put those questions in the chat. Uh, yeah, we are excited to end our conference with this amazing book and this amazing guest. So I think I will turn it over to the three of you. Thanks, Alexis. I'm so glad that you're here. I've stalked you for months and you and you finally said yes and I'm, I'm glad you're here. I'm so excited that we're here today. Thank you. Yes, I wanted to thank you for being here as well because I've, um, last week actually was 17 years that I've been battling CRPS. So thank you for all the time and energy that you've invested into the study of pain and your continuing efforts to do so. Um, and I have high praises for your most recent book, The Song of Our Scars. Um, and if you might notice, I have lots of tabs. So it really resonated with me as a CRPS warrior and pain warrior. Um, and as Alexis mentioned, you're not only a physician and author, um, but we also learned in your book that you're a chronic pain patient, like more than 1.5 million people in the world. Um, you said, in my darkest days, I didn't even know if I could practice medicine at all. Um, would you mind sharing your story of your injury and the development of chronic pain while you were in medical school? Sure. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, Kelly, Jim, and Alexis for the introduction. And and yes, I mean, I, I still, you know, I, I think for most of us, most people who are in pain, they the, the the memory of when their pain became a significant part of their life is always something that's etched in memory. Uh, you know, and, and and part of that is because that is really one of the things that pain does is that pain solidifies memories in ways that almost nothing else can, uh, which is which is good and bad. But I, I still remember when um, chronic pain became a part of my life. Uh, I was in medical school. And I was, uh, we had a five-year medical school, so I was in my third year. And before this day, I was like your, your everyday person, everyday medical student who's, who's always, he was bright and smart, but is really has no uh, personal experience with illness for, for, you know, for me, illness was an academic subject, was something that I saw and was trained to recognize and treat, but wasn't something that I lived with in any meaningful way. I've been very lucky, obviously. Uh, and I was, uh, I was, you know, just like, uh, I was, I was an athlete, so I would play basketball, I'd run, I'd lift weights. And it was one day in the gym when I was lifting weights that I heard this loud click in my back and my whole body kind of went numb. I was lifting weights. I was doing a bench press. And next thing I know, I was trapped under all this weight. I couldn't really, you know, escape it. And I felt this mortal terror, um, there, you know, thankfully there are people around me who recognize that I was stuck and I was in pain. I was, they, they, they lifted the weights off me, um, and I was just in more pain than I'd ever, ever been in my entire life. They, uh, you know, under, you know, thankfully it was on the hospital campus the gym was. So uh, my colleagues they kind of put me in this wheelchair and just rolled me off to the emergency room. And I'll, I'll remember that ride to the emergency room uh, very vividly because every every crevice in the pavement, every little bump uh, was something that, you know, I'd never been aware of. I'd never thought about that walk to the gym in my whole life. The, the way I 
experienced it on my way back uh, that day. I went to the emergency room and, you know, I was taking, I was a medical student. I was known to the staff, so they took me to the side room. I didn't have to wait in the waiting room. And then after a while, a physician came. He gave me, uh, you know, Ketorolac or Toradol, which is anti-inflammatory. And he told me that my pain is going to get better the next day. And and truly, I that's why I believe that, that that to be true because, like most other times when, you know, I think we get hurt or injured, we, that's how it goes. It hurts a lot at the beginning, but then time heals things and things get better. And then over time, you recover from whatever injury you had. But that was not going to be the case this time. I uh, That those days became weeks, weeks became months, and that pain that I experienced, which was in my lower back, became chronic. And it, it affected my life to an extent that I had no idea uh, any any condition could. Uh, you know, I think um, the, the, the back is an interesting part of the body because we don't really know what it does until it be, <laughs> until we break it, essentially, that once you, before you hurt your back, you have no idea what the back does. Uh, and I, uh, but, but you realize that the back does pretty much everything. It helps you sit, it helps you stand, it helps you lie down. Uh, you, there, there's no way that you can do anything that doesn't involve your back. Just being, being, uh, and so I could never find comfort. I could, you know, oftentimes and for, for a long time, pain was the first thing I woke up with and it was the last thing I slept with. It was the last thing that was in my head before I fell asleep and it was the first thing that came to my head as soon as I woke up. And every day I hoped it wouldn't be the case. Every day I hoped that I would wake up and I would be pain-free and I wasn't. And, and I forgot what it was like to be pain-free. I think that that memory of just a normal moment of not having pain became, became we almost became like a dream. We, I felt like I was a different person before that that day, and and so that you know that continued on for a couple of years. And I was in the middle of my medical school, and and I was very lucky that I was surrounded by people who were at least some people who were kind enough to allow me to you know, maybe leave work early a bit, maybe not, maybe allow me to get, you know, go. And, and when I went to the, for physical therapy, I was, you know, I was one of the students. So I, you know, they, they would let me just walk in and, and get, you know, get, and, and, and get some space for me to sort of just work on myself. And sometimes at work, uh, they would give me some time as well. And I know that that's not something that everyone has access to. I knew that there were many other patients who were waiting in the waiting room, but because I was I was known to everyone, and everyone, uh, everyone just knew me. They would, they would allow me, uh, you know, treatment and care that I, I, I knew was not available for everyone else. So, in that regard, I was very lucky. I was not lucky because I didn't. I lost all my friends, uh, like many of us do, and we uh, have have some an illness like this. I was very alone, and I, my family wasn't around, and it was just basically just me and living with my pain. And I will say that over really sort of years of work and years of therapy and just a lot of good luck as well uh, that I ran into people. I, I found, my, you know, I found the woman who is now my wife and she was, she was you know, gentle in helping me get through this. I had folks who let me, uh, allowed me to, gave me the space to really heal. Um, and that what, and that what all of that has done is that it's allowed me to at least live you know, a pretty normal life. I still have to, it's not the same as it was. I'm not invincible anymore. I know I have to be extremely careful. I know that pain's always around the corner. Um, and, uh, but, but I'm, but I'm in a, I'm in a much better place than I used to be. And I understand how lucky I am. Um, and so that was my, that was my, but, but this whole ordeal lasted for many years and there are many things that I couldn't do. There are types of medicine. So I knew that, you know, surgery, for example, is never going to be an option for me because, Standing in the operating room for hours is something I can never do. I still can't do, and I, I would never put my body through it. I became a cardiologist, but I also knew that there are specialties in cardiology in which we do procedures, uh, interventional cardiology. Uh, I loved the, I loved that field, but I just, you know, I, I would come back. My, my, my heart would be happy, but my back would be so sore that I just knew that I just couldn't do that long term. So I did. So it has shaped my life since then. Um, but the other thing that I thought about, and, and, and as I began, being, and I did my residency in internal medicine and my fellowship, et cetera, et cetera, I really realized that there's such a, there's a much bigger story to be told here than just my own. 
that my story as someone in pain might become a vehicle or might allow me to tell the story of something that's much bigger than I am. Uh, in the past, I've written about uh, end of life care, about how people, how medicine has changed, how uh, we spend the end of our lives. I've written about heart disease, but this was my most personal work because this was not, this was because I'm not at the end of my life. I'm not a, I don't have heart disease, but I am someone who lives with chronic pain. And so for me, this was definitely a change. But the, that moment, that I, that moment, that day that I hurt myself was my, was when my story with chronic pain began, but it's also the day that this book really uh, came, came to be as well, many years ago. I would just say that you're, that you're blessed and, and also people, who developed CRPS know the exact time and day, just, just as you, you talk about. Yeah, so I agree. It, it sticks with you forever. And like you said, mm -hmm. even that ride to the emergency room, you feel every little bump, every little vibration in the road, everything hurts. And it's things you never think of before you're disabled or you're put in that position. Um, and like you said, losing friends, because no one can really understand what you're going through. If you have to cancel plans repeatedly because of pain or exhaustion or a treatment, they don't get it to the same degree that someone living with chronic pain does. So I think you hit a lot of points that CRPS warriors can really understand and relate to. Um, I was wondering and, and if you I could... think what, one of the other things that it did was that it actually initially at least made me a worse physician. And the reason is because, you know, being a physician means that you have to always be open, always, you have to be always observing the person in front of you. You, you can't be in, in your head. And what the pain did at its worst was that I could just never get out of my own body. I could never get outside my own self to be able to attend to, I think, other people the way, you know, because I was always in some ways distracted. When I'm in the operating room, I'm thinking about how much my back hurts. If I'm, you know, stuck in a, diff in a difficult pose for, you know, holding a retractor or, you know, assisting a surgeon or doing a procedure, you know, part of me, even a small percentage, is still thinking about this is, I'm, this is, this is, I'm, I, I am in pain and I'm suffering, but I can't show it to anyone. I can't talk about it because as a physician, you know, that's not something that you want to do and, and you shouldn't do. You, your focus should really be on the patient. It was only after, but, but I think eventually it allowed me, once my pain was better, it gave me the perspective that I never had before, uh, which was, which is a perspective of what it's like to suffer, which is what it's, what, what, what it's like to uh, be someone in pain, but not look like that, look like a person in pain. Uh, you know, I think as I, I remember I, uh, you know, I had a friend, uh, I had a friend who had chronic pain, uh, you know, he was one of my buddies in med school and we used to just make fun of him because, you know, he looked totally fine and, 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 and yet he was in pain and, but we couldn't really make that empath empathic jump or leave to really think about what it was like to be him. Uh, so I think it eventually did it allow me and I think it has allowed me to be, to be more kind, to be more gentle, to be more understanding of people who may not look the part. Actually, that was going to be one of our questions for you is um, in your book, you say that physicians are imperfect creatures. Um, so what makes a good doctor? Um, I know you talk about that in your book for a while. Yeah, I mean, I've always thought about this. Uh, and, and, you know, there as, as, as you know, part of part of being in medicine is that you, you know, we train for a long period of time. So, you know, I, for example, you know, I went to start, I began my medical school in 2004, and it wasn't until 2019 that I finally started my first job as a full-time, as a full-fledged physician. So it's a very long time. And along that road, you just, you, you, you all, most of what you're doing is observing. Most of what you're doing is looking at, and it's not, not just patients, but also other physicians and other nurses and trying to see you know, and, and trying to, try, trying to, you know, in some ways, some, and almost often unconsciously think about, well, you know, what, what makes someone a good physician? What makes someone bad? What kind of physician am I going to be, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember um, 
the one of the physicians that I really looked up to um, was a cardiologist. His name was uh, his name was Joe Rogers, and I remember I was working with him on Christmas Day. It was, and I remember that day because it's, it was also his birthday. Uh, so every Christmas I know it's going to be his birthday. But you know, he was. We were both at work. We were both away from our families. We had a lot of patients, and I just know that I just remember that day was so special because. And he could walk into someone's room and within seconds connect with them. And within seconds, he would just look them in the eye and just make them feel seen and make them feel heard and attended to. Um, and, and really just went to the heart of what was what that person was experiencing. Um, and, 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 and on top of this, obviously, you need to be smart, you need to have knowledge you need to be competent you need to be professional i mean all those things are really 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 important i i totally understand that but i think it was the way that he had this profound well of empathy and kindness it wasn't about how much time he was spending with patients you know we all you know doctors always you know they're all every doctor is rushed every doctor is trying to do a lot of things you know as in medicine you know the the suits they're always putting more work on our plate Right. You know, real in the end we're like you feel like everyone else, right? Where we are employees and our bosses are trying to get the most for the least from us. Um so so we're always never gonna have the sort of time that we wish for, but it's really about how you spend that time with the patient, how do you make it worth their while, how do you connect with them in that moment that you have with them or in that time that you have with them, that you just cut through the noise and really focus on what, what they really want. Um, and so I really think that empathy and kindness is really, uh, in the end, that's what makes a physician a good physician or a good doctor or a good nurse or a good respiratory therapist or a good physical therapist, because that's that's really what that's what starts everything. I mean, if you're not empathetic, you're not going to be curious. If you're not curious, you're not going to want to learn more, or grow more. You might just be stuck in your ways because it's difficult to change or it's difficult to start a new practice or it's difficult to change some idea that you might have had or some practice that you've had when you were in medical school, even though things have changed now. So I do think that of all the qualities and of all the things that, you know, I think uh, that I think one needs to be a good physician, um, I think empathy and kindness for me is probably the most important one. Um, especially for the person in pain, especially for uh, if you are someone who is taking care of someone who is in pain, you are entirely reliant on, you know, almost transporting them yourself into that person's world inside and then seeing, seeing and experiencing that from them. You know, sometimes you'll have people coming in with heart attacks or people with a new fracture or something else or brain bleed or appendicitis in which I, I think that you don't need to make that leap or you don't need to make that jump. But for a lot of people in chronic pain, they may not have that lab test abnormality. They may, they may not have that blood clot or they may not have that mass. Or, you, you know, for them, you know, a normal test or a normal test, quote unquote, is scarier than an abnormal one because, because that means that their suffering will not have an answer. Their suffering will not be legitimized. And so I think especially for the person in pain, I I, uh, I think that the, the, the empathy is so important. And we actually have data to suggest that patients, that physicians were more empathetic, uh, that their patients actually have lesser pain over time. Because again, part of part of pain is that pain is there. Pain, pain needs to be seen, pain needs to be witnessed. Uh, as much as pain is something that we feel by ourselves, one of the chief reasons we have pain, or one of the chief purposes of pain is actually communication. Um, think about, for example, the, the, a herd of deer and one of the deer gets stuck in a trap. The reason that it, it, it bleeds and it cries for help is to alert the other deer that there's watch out for the trap or watch out for, for this, this predator. Because, and, and that is one of the reasons, the, the reason a baby cries is because he wants to communicate to his mother that, that he needs love, he needs attention or she needs attention, etc. And so part of and, and so part of pain is communication and but you can't communicate to someone who has a closed mind, who has a closed who, who who's who's not open to what you might be experiencing.
I agree that my most empathetic physicians or even the physicians that tell me outright, you know, I don't know the answer to your question, but I'm going to look it up for you. I respect them so much more than the doctors that try and talk circles around me and don't really have an answer. And so I think you're exactly right. Empathy really needs to be there, especially with chronic pain patients. Um, and we were also wondering if you could tell us the origin of your book's title, The Song of Our Scars. Um, I mean, we, we, uh, so, so the, my, uh, my editor for this book, um, you know, was really pushed me to come up with a title that wasn't, you know, wasn't just going to be, just wasn't going to be very literal, that it wasn't just going to be pain or chronic pain or, or something like that. You know, it had to be something that conveyed the text of the book is that the book is not just an encyclopedia of pain. Like, the book is not just something that is a regurgitation of facts or, you know, it, it, is, a, it, is, it, is, it is beyond that. And, uh, and that there is, and, and not that, uh, the book is not a celebration of pain, but I think it also, but I think what the, what the book is about is that it embraces the complexity of pain. And it embraces pain not as, 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 as an essential part of our experience as human beings. Um, so we, we worked a lot on the, on the title and, and I probably came up with at least, uh, at least 100 ideas that were shot down. And in the end, this, there, there is a certain lyricism to this idea that, that you know, we all have the, that, that, that pain represents the voice of these scars that we all carry. Uh, and on the cover, the person depicted on the cover does not have a visible scar. Uh, and, and those who implying again and saying that not all scars are visible, sometimes they are invisible as well. Um, and that pain is in fact connected to those, but is in fact, you know, but, but, but that it is, but, but it is more than just you know, it is more than just something that we feel in our bodies. Also, that, that it has dimensions that are beyond, uh, beyond just some, being something very simplistic. And and I think that's the other mistake that we've made in medicine, is that we've tried to simplify. We've we've tried to simplify pain. We've tried to take something that's extremely complex, that has all these sort of connections with, that that has complex biology, that is connected with so many other aspects of our lives. But because our tools are very limited, our tools were, were very simplistic and narrow, we just wanted to make it something that's something that we could, that, that, that was as narrow as possible. And part of what I'd like to open, I'd like to do with the book is actually change that and actually think about and get people thinking about the complexity of pain and, and, and embrace it rather than, than, than try to run away from it. Great. Um. You speak of the pain footprint, footprint in the brain. Uh, what does that mean? Can you let the listeners know? Sure. Um, so for, for a long time, we've been trying to get a better sense for um, how, to, how to better see pain or especially from a neurologic perspective, or how can we come up with some type of way to identify pain using an, imaging, et cetera, or like an MRI or a PET scan or something like that. And, you know, pain is unique in that there's, there's no one center, there's no one center for pain. So for example, there is a center in the brain for vision, that there's a, it's a very specific part in the brain that deals with vision, that's it. Uh, so for, for different movements, if I want to know what part of my brain is supplying the nerves for this part of my face, you can you can precisely locate it in the brain, and because the brain is very very specialized, with pain there's no such pain center. There's no one place there where pain is lives. It it, it, it is it, it is a it's it's almost the only other um, the only other if you if you the only other process that is as sort of diffuse in some ways is actually consciousness. Uh, because consciousness also, our, our ability to be conscious is not just something that's produced by one part of the brain, but it needs us to integrate all this different information from what you're seeing, smelling, hearing, feeling, and, and, and being. And pain is in some ways very, very similar. So when people have 
studied pain, uh, one of the things that they've done is that they've used um, a sort of test called functional MRI. And what is functional MRI? Functional MRI is basically you do an MRI, you put someone in an MRI scanner, and then you look at, and then you essentially do a test showing what parts of the brain are using more glucose or they're most using more sugar, essentially showing that they're more active than others. And using that map to sort of correlate parts of the brain with different things that you might be doing. And so for pain, uh, the, 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 the footprint of pain in the brain, the other, way, the other word that's been given it is, in, uh, is, a, is essentially the neurologic signature of pain in the brain. Uh, which is uh, what are the parts of the brain that light up when someone hurts? Um, and it's not just one part, it's many different parts, but also not all types of pain will have the same footprint as well. And it can, it, it, you know, one of the things that, um, so there are different parts of the brain that are responsible for giving you information like where does it hurt or how much does it hurt? Uh, how intense is the pain? Uh, or what type of pain is it? Is it because of uh, heat or is it because of cold? Is it because you're being pressed too hard or is it a chemical type of issue? Uh, so there's there's that aspect of pain, the where's, why's, and how's of pain. And then there's the emotional aspect of pain, which is uh, which is how bad does it make you feel, right? How, uh, so you know that if you, if you have your hand on uh, and and that can be different, and that then there are different parts of the brain that are responsible for those aspects of pain, and and those can be affected by so many different things. Um, you know, if for example, I mean, just think about this: that if um, if you were if you were walking, if you're with someone you love, and they put their hand on your shoulder, as opposed to if you're in a dark alley by yourself, and then suddenly you see, feel something on your shoulder, your reaction is going to be extremely different, and it should be different because the context is completely different. Let's say you are uh, feel something sharp or needle uh, in your arm, but you're getting an IV. Uh, that's very different from if someone actually took a needle, you know, and stabbed it in your arm. You won't have the same reaction. It won't make you feel the same way. Or let's say you're having pain in your body, or from, uh, and and maybe it's from you you fractured your rib a couple of days, or that you have metastatic cancer in your rib cage. The context of pain is is really really defines our experience of pain and our reaction to pain. I mean, if you think about, for example, um, if you've been someone who's been discriminated against, for example, like if you're a woman or if you're someone who's poor or if someone who's who's a minority, and your experiences with healthcare have been fraught with your symptoms not being recognized or your suffering being denied, you will how you respond to pain in the future is going to change because you will understand that though there are so many forces that are against you and that and, and so so for example like one of the uh one of the factors uh, especially for uh for black americans what the, what one of the things that determines their sensitivity towards pain is if they've had a previous history of racial discrimination and because again the more one because no you're never more vulnerable than when you're in pain because uh because all sometimes all you have is your word is there is no oftentimes there is no blood test and oftentimes there is no x-ray so you are hoping that the person you know you are speaking to your physician or your nurse is going to believe you and uh and and and, and that puts people in, in a very disadvantageous place oftentimes. Uh, and, and even more so if they've had if they're part of a group that is discriminated against traditionally when they seek medical care. So as far as and so and so so coming back, so there are so there are different parts of the brain that relate to different aspects of pain. Uh, and, and 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 scientists can actually sort of turn them on or off or, or can actually look at what part of the so one of the things that pain is very related to closely is memory, for example. So if you take away the ability of ice, for example, to remember, not only do they lose memory of other things, but they actually their 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 acute pain is less likely to turn into chronic pain. Because again, part of chronic pain is that in some ways our body just 
at, at some point it just remembers it too well. I remember it so well that even when the initial insult or injury goes away, that the brain, that it just almost becomes like an automatic vicious cycle that exists independently on its own. It doesn't diminish the fact that it is it is causing a lot of suffering. That's not to say that it is not real or not. In the end, what really matters is how someone feels. But that's really one of the places that we are learning a lot more about pain is in fact not by looking at the body, but by understanding the mind and thinking about what are the different factors that are related to the pain experience and what are the different things that turn acute pain into chronic pain. Taylor, just a second. Uh, could you tell, uh, we were gonna ask you about the research at Northwestern with the, with the fMRI. Could you just briefly talk about that, please? Sure. So yeah. So so one of the people that I spoke to, who's who's doing a lot. Of, I mean, I spoke to a lot of scientists who are doing some really cool stuff. Uh, and and again, I think this really is a true. There, there's a lot of exciting work that's going on in the space of pain. I I do want to tell that to listeners that, uh, you know, that that there there are a lot of really really smart people out there who are trying to really get to the bottom of how people hurt and what we can do to help. One of those people is a scientist, is a neuroscientist called uh, whose name is Vanya Aptarian. He's at Northwestern, and he's really one of the. He was he initially was an electrical engineer, and then became a neuroscientist. So he is actually one of the few people who has who's really an expert in functional MRI, and he's really one someone who's developed the field, is doing a lot of cool research into it. And one of the things that he's been focused on is thinking about well, you know why. You know what is really the origin of chronic pain? This is, many many people have, for example, in my when I had my injury, there are so many people who have who have had these acute injuries. But why does someone one person develop chronic pain and the other person doesn't? Even and one of the things that we know is that it's not the severity of the initial illness. Uh, sorry, of the of the initial injury. So it's not like if someone got hurt more versus less that that somehow predicts that one is going to develop acute uh, chronic pain or not. Um, you know, one of the things that I was that I, at least I thought would would explain my pain was the fact you know when I got this MRI of my back, it showed it showed all of these abnormalities on my in my back like I had this prolapsed disc, I have these degenerative changes. and I was told that well this is why you're in pain because you're you're you've had you've had this terrible Uh, you have all these terrible findings, but you know the other thing that we know is that those findings also don't correlate with the severity of chronic pain. In fact, when people have studied, like if you take you know a group of people, just pick them off on the street and they're not in any pain, and you put them in an MRI scanner, many of them will have the same findings that I did. And and so uh, his research is is trying to sort of really get to the bottom of why that happens. And one of his interesting papers was actually looked at people who had who had 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 acute back injuries. And I looked at those who went on to develop uh, chronic pain, and studied how that footprint of pain changed uh, in the brain over time. And one of the things that one of the sort of key papers that I think has, in fact, has really shaped my own on thinking about chronic pain, uh, especially at least in that setting specifically, is that initially when people had a sort of acute pain, the the footprint of pain in the brain was much more. In the areas which are related to the hows, whys, wheres, and whens of pain, uh, or sort of the somatosensory aspects of pain, uh, in which the, uh, which is much more related to the physical injury that someone had, but that over time the parts of the brain that begin to light up more in people who develop chronic pain was more related to the emotional aspects of pain, uh, and the other thing that pain is very chronic pain especially is very related to. Is memory, and so it started to really sort of focus in on those parts of the brain that are related to just how we form memories. So it's in some ways, um, so the way he described chronic pain to me, at uh, least, and based on his research, was that you know pain is a trauma that the body remembers, and 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 then at time and, and after a while, it may not need a signal from below to come up to. And to create the same experience, but that it becomes so learned um, that that it becomes independent. And part of this is because we are designed to remember painful episodes more strongly than almost anything else in our life. I mean, think about you know when I think about my own childhood when I was a young boy, 
and I think about the things that are most that I remember the most, they're oftentimes me falling off a slide or, or, or getting or some type of like bad injury that I had when I was a kid. Or every time you've been in pain, those memories become etched into your brain. But there is a reason for that. And the reason is that pain is in in essence, pain is a, a defense mechanism. It is there to protect us and to give us these lessons uh, and, and teach us what not to do. So, you know, for example, I have a seven year old daughter and, you know, I can I might tell her many times to you know, stay away from the electric socket or stay away from the hot stuff or don't get close to the oven when the light is on. And sure, she'll listen to me. But what she but you know what she'll really listen to when she does, in fact, grab that hot pan and it hurts mm-hmm. like hell. And then she'll never do that again. And she'll probably remember that for the rest of her life because it is going to be something. Because, and that is really one of those. And yet, at some level, it doesn't remain a defense mechanism anymore. At some level, the sort of... Me- and, and, and the other reason why we remember pain so well is because, especially compared to other animals, we live very long lives. So on average now we you know we live seventy years, eighty years. That's the average lifespan in this country, uh, and for many other people. So we we are trained not just to remember pain for a few months or weeks, but to really remember it for entire lifespans. And so and and that is why. I, but at some point, it goes away from being something that's protective to one that is really just causing us to suffer. And I think that's really what we're dealing with when we're thinking about at least a lot of instances of chronic pain. So yes, it sounds like um, we centralize our pain and you spoke of how acute pain will then transfer into chronic pain. Um, But can you elaborate a little bit more about how when we hear the phrase, it's all in your head is both true but invalidating at the same time? Yeah, so I mean, so so this the, the the statement, you know, all in your head has you know essentially been has been weaponized for a long time by people as a way of dismissing uh, other people's suffering by implying that if something is in your head, that in some ways it is created or simulated, or that it is someone's fault rather than something that is real. I mean, the fact of the matter is that our entire conscious experience is in our head. If you take away the head, it's nothing different than anesthesia. I mean, if you take away our brain's ability to turn nociception into pain, which is what happens in the brain, you'll feel nothing, but then you won't even be alive at all. Every single thing that we experience, but if you experience hunger, if you experience love, if you experience joy, if you experience grief, if you experience trauma, it is all centered inside our heads. It doesn't make anything less real. Um, I mean, I, you know, I work at the VA, for example, and something that I see on an on almost daily basis is PTSD. And unless you've seen, P- and once you see PTSD and once you see someone really living with PTSD, and I know many people, many people don't, but once you see it once, it there you, you understand how deep that trauma is. And no one can tell me that that's not more real than an actual injury that someone, or physical injury that someone has had. You know, I mean, if you see how deeply that type of trauma can affect someone and change them, someone forever. Uh, you understand that that type of trauma is as real, if not more, than almost anything else we can experience. The problem is that we've created a health system, and or we've created a, in medicine, we, we are so focused on things that are that are physical or anatomic or mechanical because that's what our tools are good for. You know, our tools can put a bone back together, but if you think about how good are we at understanding what's going on on in the brain? It's still very primitive. So you know we've talked about fMRI, for example, and fMRI is you know one of the most cutting edge technologies, but it's still very very uh, crude. All it's doing is just seeing what parts of your brain are eating up more glucose than others. It's not if it's not giving you any more information than that. And the brain is one of the most is it is the most complex organ known in 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 the known universe. And so I think that what we've done, and then the other thing that we did was that we've, we've created this um, separation between mind and body. And the history of that goes back to the time of the Renaissance when you know, the, there, there was all, these, the, all this progress being made in science, but, but there, there was a lot of pushback 
from uh, uh, from religious forces. And so they essentially created a pact. What they said is that, you know, let us take care of the body and we'll, we, you know, but and you can keep the mind and you can keep all the metaphysical stuff, etc. And then the other thing that we did was then we created the field of psychiatry and the rest of medicine. And we told the psychiatrist, well, you're the mind doctors, we're the body doctors. And over time, the body doctors have made a lot of progress, right? We've, 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 we've developed vaccines, we've developed medicines, we can do surgery, we can do anesthesia, blah, 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 blah. And if you think about how much or how much progress we've made in understanding mental health, very it's it's nowhere even near the same type of progress we've made. But because of that dichotomy, it's become so ingrained in medicine, where we feel like, oh, if something is happening in the mind, it won't affect the body, or if there's something happening in the body, it won't affect the mind. The fact of the matter is that both of those things are more connected than 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 we've ever appreciated. And the longer we keep denying that what happens in the mind doesn't affect the body or what happens in the body doesn't affect the mind or that they're not actually two separate things, but they're one and the same thing, I think we're going to fail a lot of people. We're going to fail a lot of people. And so so part of what I want to do through this book is to actually reclaim that phrase, is to actually take it away, de-weaponize de it, and make it something that is not used as a weapon or as a taunt to delegitimize people, but to use it as a way to a express the reality of pain. That pain is, in fact, if not all in our head, mostly in our head, because that is really where the experience of pain is created. It is it is created inside our brain. But that is but but that is also the same. But 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 that is also true of the pain that you get after you've broken your arm. It's also this, but it, and it's also the same for the pain that you have when you have chronic regional pain syndrome, or if you have fibromyalgia, or any of these chronic pain syndromes, everything is in the head. And, 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 and that by saying that or by reclaiming it, one of the th things I also want to do is that I also believe that many therapies that can help people with pain live better are those that are focused on the head. Therapies that are focused on helping us live better with pain. And so by destigmatizing this statement, I actually want to make sure that we can get access to all the types of different treatments and all the new treatments that are being developed for chronic pain, many of which are focused on what is happening between our ears and behind our eyes. And, and I, I think that some of those things are really, really promising. And this will really require a cultural shift uh, in, in, in medicine. Um, and the fact of the matter is that a person in pain, the patient, is never is, is in no... <laughs> is unfortunately not in a position to be able to make that change because, you know, if a patient in pain comes in and they know, and we all know, I mean, this has happened during the pandemic where people have been under a lot of stress and that stress has led to a lot of people's pain getting worse or they've been socially isolated, they've been outside their comfort zone, etc. If they come in and they tell a doctor that, you know, my pain is affected with my level of stress, they're worried rightly that that might actually make the physician take their pain less seriously. Um, because in medicine, we've been so acculturated to this idea that, oh, we're only going to treat pain that we can visualize on an x-ray or, uh, or a scan, and everything else is just something that a person just has to live with. So patients won't be able to, are, are, are in no position, unfortunately, to make this type of cultural change, but I think physicians are. And I think that's what, so one of the things that I want to do is actually change how the young physicians of our, of, of our current era think. Who are, being, who are training right now. You know, the old uh, the old guard is sometimes hard to change how they think, but I think the gen the new generation of residents and physicians who are coming out, I, I want to change how they think about pain, how they treat patients, how they approach them. Um, and so that's also a huge part of what I would like to achieve. I think you did an excellent job of explaining why it needed to be destigmatized in the book. And I know for me, it was really important to read that part because early on when I was first diagnosed, I was told it was all in my head, but it was more of an accusation or the doctor throwing in the towel and not really knowing what to do. And so that was their best explanation for it. So I appreciate that you are trying to change that and not make it. So it seems like an attack on your symptoms or what you're feeling. Um, you did say that Buddhists often subdue intolerable pain by confronting it fully. 
There's a lot of confusion around the acceptance and commitment therapy. Can you please explain it and the research behind it? Sure. So, um, so one of the so acceptance and commitment therapy. So, so one of so which is usually de defined as acceptance uh, therapy uh, is a form of cognitive therapy. So we've all heard of, heard of cognitive behavioral therapy, and acceptance theory is one part of it. But I think you know because the word acceptance is all often used uh, in our cultural context in for different ways. I think a lot of people just uh, I think a lot of people want to hear that. Um, they go back to maybe their visit to the physician in which they're told that, well, you just have to accept the pain and mm -hmm. we can't do anything. So, so oftentimes the word acceptance is thought of as resignation, that you should just be resigned to the fact that you are going to be in pain and that you're going to suffer and that, you know, nothing can be done about it. Uh, but really what acceptance therapy is, is that there, there are two aspects so when you are in pain, there, 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 there are these two broad aspects. One is this desire to control how much you hurt, to control the intensity of the pain. So let's say that, and I go back to how I was, which is that I, you know, when I had, when my pain was at its worst, I didn't want to. I didn't want to leave my room. I didn't. I do. I just wanted because I knew that well. If I went to someone's birthday party or if I went to watch a movie, that would mean that I might. I'm. I. I would be leaving my so-called comfort zone. I might be in positions where I'm extremely uncomfortable. It's really, really going to hurt. And what if that pain makes, you know, does some irreparable damage to my body? Like what if? Uh, what if I can walk? More? What if the pain gets so much worse because I overheard it that. I can't control it or I have some type of crisis. Um, so one of the desires that someone has in pain is to make sure that you don't hurt more uh, because it all is just bad enough. Um, the other way of thinking is that, well, I'm just going to live my life even if it hurts. I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to do X. And that trying to uh, control the pain that I am, that I am, I that I I will do. I will prioritize whatever activity I'm doing over being, over having less pain. And so, so what acceptance therapy does is it tries to shift our focus away from controlling pain to essentially living our life despite the pain. And one of its applications, especially with regards to pain, has been this idea. Has been this new form of therapy called pain reprocessing therapy, which is essentially, uh, especially for patients with chronic pain, especially for someone in which we know that, well, the pain doesn't represent a new threat to your body, right? Because I think that that's one of the things that as soon as you hurt, you know, if you if you have any type of pain, the moment you hurt more, your fear is, is there going to be some type of irreparable damage to my body, right? Am I, that that isn't going to leave me worse off than I was, that is going to and so, and what, and the philosophy of acceptance therapy is at least for patients who have chronic pain in which most of the times and the, the, the new sort of pain doesn't represent a change in how you, it, it really reflects, it doesn't reflect that you are under some new sort of threat or new processes emerged to help people focus more on that I'm just going to live my life. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to live in pain, but I'm not going to limit the things that I do. Um, and and again, I don't think it is for everyone. But 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 what we've seen is that people in pain are very resilient. People in pain have you know for a lot of people in pain, uh, the crises that people face during the pan pandemic are something that they've just lived with. They 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 know what being socially isolated means. They know what having a chronic disability means. So for 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 many people in pain, this is something that they've they've dealt with and they've they've. Uh, and so, I, so there's and so there's a lot of promising data that that type of approach can actually improve people's quality of life and improve people's functioning with pain. Uh, and the newer therapies are being designed more specifically for pain, like pain reprocessing therapy, which is also a form of cognitive therapy, can actually reduce the intensity that people have uh, from pain as well. And this has uh, been shown in randomized trials, which is really the highest level of evidence that we have in medicine that at least for people who have chronic back pain, people who receive this form of therapy are much more likely to be pain-free 
and those who receive our usual form of care. So that's those are some of my, um, the um, ideas or philosophies behind acceptance and commitment theory, uh, mm -hmm. theory. That really what it does is, you know, one of the things that, you know, pain is one of those things that the more you try to control it, sometimes the more powerful it becomes, the more you want to be pain free, the more it grows in power. And somehow, sometimes, uh, especially, and it doesn't mean that you shouldn't seek medical care. It doesn't seem that you should not seek a diagnosis or you should seek help. I mean, those things all go together. But I think one of the, but the key aspect of acceptance theory, which at least resonates with me personally, is trying to have us let go of controlling the pain or minimizing the pain, but trying to move on and trying to see how much of our life can we live despite the pain uh, and despite the pain. <laughs> We have one more question, and then we're just going to move to any questions. Kelly? Thank you for answering that for us. Um, uh, you quoted in your book that the fear of movement is the mortar that helps erect the prison of pain. Um, I know that truly resonated with me because I faced the fear of movement, especially early on with my CRPS. Um, can you please expand on that statement further? Of course. Uh, so the fear of movement, and because in medicine we have a technical term for everything, is called kinesophobia. Kineso can from kinetic, which is movement phobia, fear. And uh, you know, I go back to when I first got injured. Uh, I didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to move. I didn't. I, I because my worry was that I have this, I have this, I have this vertebra, I have this spinal column, I have this bone kind of sticking in my spine, and if I move, what if, what, what if I make things worse? And it, it certainly felt like if I'm moving or stretching or walking or doing anything that I was actually doing physical harm to my body, that, that, that there was actual stuff going on in my body, you know, that, that was going to cause, you know, at times irreparable harm. And so my way out of that was trying to not move at all. And then when I remember when I was first taken to a physical therapist, it, was, it, it really hurt. I mean, I was in so much pain, and um, and I, you know, we, we did, he showed me how to do all these stretches, and I did a few, and I was just, I was done. I was exhausted, and I was like, I can't do this at all. My entire body, I, you know, it was, I was asked to sort of lie down and sort of bring my knees up to my chest. And I couldn't even get them past my hips. I, it just, I just couldn't do it. And and the reason is that that's also again part of what part of the defense mechanism of pain is that you know let's say if you if you if you fell off a tree and you fractured your leg well yes you don't want to put your weight on it right you don't want to move it because again you otherwise it may not heal well it may you know get disaligned but and and so so there is a there is a reason why we feel that uh, but in in many cases of chronic pain. You know, even when movement is not going to hurt, that that behavior that is designed into our bodies still remains. And 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 what happens with it? You know, one of the people I learned a lot from while I was researching this book was an anthropologist. His name is Drew Leader, and he's and and so he's done a lot of. He's also someone who lives with chronic pain, and you know, he really wanted. And he's he he's a physician also, but wanted to experience the wanted to study the experience of people in chronic pain. And the population that he found, or the group of people that he found who's experienced most closely resembled those of people in chronic pain was actually people who were in prison. And the reason is that as you heard, your, your life shrinks. You know, as I've said, you, you may lose friends. Uh, you may stop, you know, getting out of your space. Uh, I remember nothing scared me more than a flight of stairs. Uh, I, you know, I, and, and so your life shrinks and shrinks and shrinks until it is very, very small. And, and not only is it physically small, even from a, from a, from in your mind becomes narrow too, because you can't think about the past because the past just reminds you of, of, of this person that you can't relate to anymore. Some the person who never felt pain and who had no idea how lucky they were. And you don't want to think about the future because you just feel so hopeless. You feel like, oh, well, I'm just going to be in pain in the future. Why, you know, that just, that just, be, like for me, I thought that I would never be able to finish medical school. I'd never be able to do the things that work so hard to do. And so you're, you're really trapped, not just physically, but also temporally in that moment 
in which you are hurting. And so, and part of that is because you don't, because of that fear of movement. And so one of the things we know about exercise, for example, for pain, is that it does show that there is initially that, you know, you can, that, that the pain may increase early on after you start exercising, but long-term there are a lot of benefits from pain and that exercise is entirely safe. And that's part of the battle of living with chronic pain as well is to actually overcome that fear of movement uh, and overcome that fear that movement or, or just or just daily activities is going to make things worse. Because again, pain is so powerful uh, that the, the more you, you actually comply to that urge to not move, the more the pain becomes, the more deconditioned your body becomes, the weaker you become and the smaller your world becomes and the pain only increases. Amen. Thank you. I want to want to thank you for tremendous presentation. I think we we could talk all night, yeah, but um, we won't. <laughs> I know, absolutely. You had so many great great points in your book. So thank you for answering all of our questions. Yeah. Alexis, yeah. were there any questions? I think there was one medical specific question. There's, of course, a lot of uh, conversation in the chat. Um, everyone able to relate to the discussion. Oh, mm -hmm. um, try not to make sure I'm jacking up words. This is one question. Are you familiar with how fascia and its significant contribution to pain because of the plethora of superficial nerve innervation? That's the question that we have. <laughs> well, I mean, we know that... Uh, that the nerves are especially related to nociception, which is the experience of which is essentially how our body detects, you know, signals that it doesn't like and then brings them upstairs. Um, and then, but it is a brain that then interprets that those signals and decides what to do with them. Um, and uh, whether you, if, so for example, uh, if you are someone who is running a marathon, you might have a lot of nociception because you're, you're literally putting your body through all this physical torture, but yet because you know that this is something that you can control, that this is something that you've done, this is that you're not, that you are, that you can always stop it as soon as you want, you're in complete control of that experience. It may not hurt you the way that same signal would if you're suffering from an, 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 an illness or a, or a medical condition uh, that, is, that is causing you to feel that way. So, you know, what I will say is that we're still learning a lot about how nociception happens, and it, and but I do want to say that the, the, that you know that, that that is just one aspect of the pain experience. Pain is taking physical information, is taking emotional experience, is taking context, is taking memory, is taking how much you're paying attention to something. I mean, one of the interesting findings, one of the papers that I think is really I think uh, that that that's open that opened a lot of people's eyes was. You know, they studied these soldiers in World War II who were, you know, coming back from the battlefield, and many of them had these gruesome, horrific injuries. And most of them actually didn't report being in any pain at all. I mean, these are people who had their limbs shot off or, you know, who had horrific injury because they were so overwhelmed and they were so, that, that they couldn't actually convert the physical nociception into the pain experience. So, but, but, I, but again, you know, as I said at the start, I, I want people to be, I want people to know that, that there's a lot of people working really hard to understand pain better. I think pain uh, research is better funded today than it's ever been before. Part of it is because of the opioid epidemic, because we realize that, well, this, that that's just, that's just something that is not very effective and not very safe and that, but, but that we need something else. We need something that is going to be safer and better and that we can, we can give to people because so, so that what what that has done is that it has injected a lot of attention and a lot of urgency and a lot of money into high quality pain research. Awesome. I am not seeing many other questions in the chat, but I know there's been conversations happening throughout this entire session. Uh, Jim, anything you want to wrap no, us up? No, I just want to know. Um, such, such a tremendous book. Are, what's next for you in, re, in writing? Um, I am, uh, you know, right now, you know, for me, is I think especially because after this book, uh, 
right now, you know, for me, the, the, the book was just the beginning of just starting the conversation of getting people to really start thinking and paying attention to this. Uh, but I'm still learning. And, you know, I think there's sessions like this where I'm still learning. I'm still learning from other people who are in pain. I'm still I'm from other physicians who are doing research, etc. So for me, the book was just the beginning of making sure that we can get people to attend to this issue. I mean, we live in a world where it's very hard to get people's attention. The new cycle is insane. Every day there's some new crazy story uh, that dominates everything. You know, today it was, you know, Queen Elizabeth, tomorrow is going to be the midterms, and then it's going to be all, you know, war in Ukraine, blah, blah, blah. So to get people to talk about something that is not time sensitive, which, you know, pain is not something that happened yesterday or today. It's been there for a long time. And so, you know, for me, the book is something that can hopefully get people's attention and at least give some pause and then allow, allow me, allow others to really have this conversation, bring it to light. Um, so my focus is really just on that right now. I, I, I actually don't know what I'm going to write on. I'd love to know. Um, I have no idea I would, I would ever, ever write a book on pain, for example. So when I, uh, you know, I'm, uh, and so, but, but I still remember the day that, uh, that, you know, I, I uh, thought that there was, there was so much here and I did, I did have something to say and that, you know, my own experience of pain could at least, it, it, it's not a memoir, but I think that my experience of pain allows me to, to, to be able to speak the language, to be able to speak to patients in a way that maybe someone who hasn't had that experience might not be able to. Absolutely. I think, Absolutely. yeah, I think you definitely can. You portrayed it perfectly. Well, thank you so much. I definitely put the link to the book in the chat once again. So be sure that if uh, you're interested, which it sounds like many of you are, you go ahead and purchase that book. So much information shared here this evening. And I'm just so honored that this was our uh, grand finale session for our week-long conference. So thank you so much for joining us.